why UConn's title hopes hinge on more than just Paige Beckers. You're locked on. You are locked on UConn, your daily podcast on the UConn Huskies, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thanks for making Locked On UConn your first listen every day. We are free and available wherever you get your podcasts and on YouTube, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Before we dive into today's show, I want to take a quick moment to share some news. Thanks for for two fantastic guests like Emily Adams, who will be on here shortly, insightful co-hosts like Dan Meehan, and some great interviews like with Eric Riba. This October has been a huge month for us at Locked On UConn. Our community is growing incredibly fast and it's all thanks to listeners like you special shout out to my everydayers for listening on audio and on youtube and finally here's something that makes me especially proud every time we grow we're able to give back even more we're committed to supporting to two causes close to our hearts donating 10 percent of our revenue to bleeding blue for good and another 10 percent to husky ticket project that means every follow download and subscription helps support uconn athletes and sends kids to experience the excitement of UConn basketball and football. So make sure you're, you're subscribed to wherever you enjoy this. Please take a second to do so. Together, we're building something special and helping make a real difference for Husky fans now and for the future. Thanks for making Locked on UConn your first listen every day. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. New customers, place a $5 bet and you'll get started with $150 in bonus bets if you win your first $5 bet. Visit FanDuel.com to get started. All right, you're back on Locked On UConn. We bring in Emily Adams of the Hartford Current beat reporter who covers the UConn women. Back by popular demand, people missed you. Um, my my first question to you, Emily, is we'll jump right into this, into this. With so much pressure on Paige to deliver on that elusive national title, what needs to happen for UConn to truly become a championship team this season? Uh, I mean, I think number one, and I know we'll talk about this, later but you know I think number one is stay healthy like that has been the thing for the last three years they haven't had trouble really for the most part getting to the final four they haven't had trouble winning games they haven't had trouble winning the big east um but it it, you know it it feels like whether it's you look at that final four in pages freshman year you look at the final four last year you look at the national championship game um in 2022 it just it always feels like they get to the end and and something's missing. They just kind of run out of gas and can't can't quite get over the hill back into to being that that true number one. Um, and some of that, you know, it's really hard to win national titles. I feel like we don't talk about that enough. Um, but at the same time, like this is a roster that that has the talent to win a national title, um, like undeniably. Um, so if if that roster can make it through a season. Um, I think that that has to be sort of the expectation and and the ceiling. Um, and then number two, I think, is just sort of the the gelling of it all and and kind of the the figuring out the chemistry and the figuring out where all of the new pieces fit in with this group and fit in with Paige. Um, you know, I've I've said it, it wouldn't surprise me if we see a little bit of ugliness in non conference mm-hmm. play, kind of like we saw last year. You know, they they lost that NC State game with AZ, with the full roster playing last year. Um, So it's, you know, it's one of those things where this is a team that's going to develop as the year goes on. And I think as long as they keep developing and keep improving and keep kind of building on things, they're going to end up where they want to be. But injuries disrupt that, uh, which is why I think ultimately, like everything is going to come back to what personnel are available when. That's a great segue. You're a pro. So what's the what's the uh, health right now of the team? Like, what's the where, where are we at? Where, where are we at with this team from a health perspective? Um, you know, we're seven days away or a week away from the first game. Um, I think Gino said at last check there are nine players that would be available. Is that still where we're at, or is it less? Is it more? Yeah, I think that's around what we're looking at still. Um, Big East Media Day, we had KK Arnold um, got added to the injury report. You know, kind of indicated that she had like rolled her foot or her ankle or something mm-hmm. at practice. Um, it doesn't seem, I, you know, with things like that, it sounds like it's kind of a like minor sprain type sure. of situation. Um, and so usually that's not a super long term thing. Hopefully, you know, even if she's not good for 
the exhibition um, or even for BU on the seventh, I think, you know, she should yeah. be totally fine in the near future. Um, we saw obviously that UConn posted some content yesterday. Um, AZ said at Big East Media Day, she's been involved in five on five again with a little bit of contact. Um, mm-hmm. We saw a little bit of that on, on the social channels yesterday. So that's really good to see her just moving freely and, and able to do contact and be guarded and things like that. Um, and, and Gino seems very optimistic about where she is in the progression. They're going to take things slow with her. Like she's absolutely not going to play for the first week or two. Um, but it, it wouldn't surprise me if we start to see her like late November, early December, start to work back in at, at a limited capacity. I think she'll be kind of on a pitch count, um, especially early on. Um, and then we'll kind of ramp up just in the interest of, of preserving her for as long as they possibly can. For um, sure. I'm trying to think, I think everybody else is in pretty good shape. Um, com- uh, Ayanna Patterson is the one we talked about, obviously. Sure. Yep. There's some uncertainty still whether she'll be back in time for the opener. But um, again, doesn't seem like a long term thing with her. She just kind of popped her shoulder, it seems like, in practice. Um, and so they're, again, I-, I think they're just being kind of hyper, hyper cautious with everybody right now. Um, rightfully so based on how the last, mm-hmm. the last couple of years have gone. But, um, I think they're in pretty good shape, um, especially, you know, to, to hit that December stretch and have most of the, the core group available. Well, that's good to hear. Um, some quotes from, I don't know if it's, I don't know if it was Big East media day, but this is probably just around practice. Uh, Gino was saying the talent I think we have, and we're much deeper and will hopefully offset the lack of experience and that it's a great sign because they always look to her and talking about Paige, that they need to step, stop looking to her as often as they do. Answer those two questions separately. Do you feel like this team is truly kind of understanding that Paige is obviously, everyone understands Paige is the leader, but do they, but do, do you think Gino feels just like he said, it's good to see that they're doing things without having to make sure that Paige is kind of doing it first, right? That they're, they're kind of forming an identity around not just her, but around the others as well and kind of creating that chemistry. Do you feel like that is kind of what we're going to see, even though it could be, could be a little choppy early or is, is that kind of where, where, where the, where the team is at right now, trying to find an identity outside of just Paige Beckers? Yeah, I think it it can sometimes sort of sound contradictory to have that sure. idea of like, you know, Paige has to be aggressive and Paige has to control the game and, and all of that. But also we don't want to just rely on Paige. Um, and I think a lot of that comes with, like they have to be able to take Paige off the floor. That's kind of the biggest reason right, I feel right. need depth and chemistry and, and other players to step up is, and, and Gino said this, you know, everybody plays really well when Paige is on the floor. Everybody else is good at making plays when Paige is on the floor and can kind of have that gravitational pull and can facilitate, you know, as well as she is, is able to. Um, and she just impacts so many areas of the game. But, uh, you know, as soon as you pull her off, suddenly you don't really have a veteran on this team. Um, So, you know, a lot of young guys are having to learn how to be like floor generals very quickly. Um, You know, Caitlin Chen obviously is a veteran, but is not a veteran with UConn. So she's having to get comfortable very quickly with just kind of her voice and and her place on this team as, as, you know, a vocal leader. Um, And I think, you know, that's, that's sort of where you need, the development from the younger players is you, is you need them to be able to run the floor for a quarter in a big East game when they're trying to rest page right. before they go to South Carolina. You know, I, I think it's, it's so important with how hard their non-conference slate is because I mean, that stretch in December, they play three rough. or four ranked teams in like two or three weeks. So it's, I mean, she's going to be playing 35 let, minutes a game. Yeah. Let me ask you a question about this because you mentioned you got to be able to take page off the floor. Um, during like Big East play to kind of give her a break when you're going to go to South Carolina or something like that. Do you feel like, and this is, this is, this is not even a criticism of Gino, but I think it's kind of like, you know, he's so used to the standard of play that some, do you think sometimes it's hard for him to take her off the floor because he doesn't want to see the, the play drop a little bit? Cause I know I listen, coaches get upset when their, their standards aren't met and when they have players on the bench that they can play that automatically know that we're going to be in good shape. Do you think that's kind of the 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 difficult nature of that is kind of like he's just like man if I take her off the floor it doesn't feel like this team runs the same does that does that make sense yeah I, I'm yeah a hundred percent and and Gina has this this was something that came up a lot last year actually is 
like Gino has this philosophy of, you know, you put the best five players on the floor to give you the best chance to win no matter what. Um, and so, you know, there were times last season when, you know, they have six, six Amari DeBerry sitting on the bench with one healthy forward. And, you know, we're all sitting there going, well, why isn't she playing? Like, why would you not just put some fresh legs out there for a couple of minutes? Um, and, and I think that's just kind of not his style. Like if he does not feel like a player is prepared to, even if it's not elevate the standard to maintain the standard, he's yep, not yep. going to put them out there. Um, and I think that's sometimes to his own detriment. I, I think it was last year at times, especially during Big East play. But I think this year, like the, the players that they kind of replaced those outgoing transfers with are, I think at a, at a higher level of like ready to plug and play than, than anybody they had on the bench last year. You know, I think this year they have just sort of the, the raw talent, I think where, where players can develop into those roles as the season goes on and things. And so hopefully by the time we hit Big East play, you know, some of these freshmen will be ready to, to sort of step up into those roles. Um, but it's, again, I think it's hard because it is a thing that just comes with time and experience a lot of the time. Um, for sure. so you have to really kind of accelerate that process to get them to to where you want them to be by, you know, March of this year. Absolutely. Well, when we return, we'll talk about something I've been saying, how a healthy AZ FUD is like adding an all-star at the trading deadline. We'll explain after this. Hey, NFL fans, you can start the season with a big return on FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook. So when you get a hunch in the middle of a game, you can check out the latest stats or view live play-by-play -play and so much more on the same page where you place your bets. You'll get started with $150 in bonus bets guaranteed. And when you place your first $5 bet, that's FanDuel.com for all new customers. That's how you get started. Get those bonus bets. Visit FanDuel.com to get started. All right, we're back on Locked on UConn with Emily Adams, beat reporter for the Hartford Current, covering the UConn women. So I've made this argument, and I've heard Gino not say this word for word because him and I are two different people, uh, contrary to popular belief. Uh, when we're talking about AZ, I've made that argument that adding her full strength. Now, we know, as you, as you just chronicled in the last segment, that she's not going to start. She's not going to play for a while. She's, she's starting to play a little five on five, which is great to hear. You, you kind of gave us that news earlier. But I do feel like as she has that pitch count and as it starts to elevate by by January, I'm just going to use that as kind of a, you know, a, a starting point by January going into February and then obviously into March. UConn has an advantage that no other team has in the country where they can add essentially a top five WNBA pick to their team and plug her in and elevate their team even more likely when people are kind of established in new roles. Do you agree with that? Yeah, I, I think, you know, it's, you're going to, I think the, the you know, adding someone at a trade deadline is honestly a good comparison because I think it also is something that might not look great at first. You right. know, I think you throw AZ on the floor. And, and I think, you know, this goes back to even just like the three-point contest on first night. Like Gino has said that she is rusty. Like that's just the reality. She hasn't played competitive basketball five on five with contact in a year um and it's a long time and, and you know before that her previous two seasons were also limited she didn't you know she has never played a full 30 games in a college season mm -hmm. uh much less you know the the 35 to 40 that you play if you do a full ncaa tournament run so it, you know it i think it's when she does come back there's gonna be some growing pains with it um, which is why it's interesting to me whether, you know, they try and do that later in November before that super like intense stretch of ranked games. If they try to bring her back in the middle of that stretch, if they just hold off and wait until after that. Yeah. Um, so the, the way that they navigate, that's going to be very interesting, but I think once you hit, you know, big East tournament NCAA tournament, that's when having a player like that is so, so valuable. Someone who just is another dominant force who can if Paige is having a bad shooting night make up for that production sure. you know they last year UConn did not have anyone who could make up for Paige's production if she wasn't having a good night and that's I mean ultimately really what happened in the national championship game Paige 
had her worst game of the tournament, which was still pretty good. Um, <laughs> and they couldn't, you know, you can't outscore Iowa. So it's, I think that's going to kind of be the biggest game changer for them is just having another player that teams have to be afraid of another player with that gravitational pull that like top of the scouting report, you know, reputation like page has. Yeah. Do you think and that, that's a great point? I think I wanted to ask you this because as she, as she ramps up, do you, do you think that it goes back to Gino kind of being sometimes he does things to his detriment because that's just his standard. But do you think he's willing to um, not he's not he's willing not really to sacrifice games is not what I'm saying, but willing to if you if, if you if you if you went to Gino and said, we're going to be again like a three seed because we're not going to go 35 and one this year or whatever it is because of how difficult the schedule is and working in a bunch of new players. But by the end of the year, that two or three seed that we are has a healthy AZ FUD and she's taking on some of the roles, as he put that AZ can take on whenever Paige is not on the floor. And you just said that, like, you, do you think he would take that in a heartbeat or do you think he would is, is more interested in kind of getting everyone on the same page earlier than later? Yeah, I mean, I think it's he is someone who just like needs to win. You know, I, <laughs> yeah. I think that's in his DNA there, you know, and so I think it's hard for him to like it's hard. I think he just doesn't have that the the ability to take a player who's winning you a game off the floor and put one who is not going to win you a game on the floor. Right. Um, but I, I also think, and maybe I hope that there has been, like they've learned something from the last couple of years because, you know, you look at like Paige, Paige came back, frankly, when she shouldn't have in that 2022 national championship game run. You mm -hmm. know, it she was barely off of a surgery recovery. Um, and then, tears her ACL three months later and you know a major factor in ACL tears is having the knee previously weakened so you know I, I think it's one of those things where you just don't want to push it this year you know like everything everything feels so fragile I feel like coming into this just from the way the last few seasons have gone um and so I just like they they can't push anything they can't like I, you know with with someone like AZ you just have to be so careful um and and save her to me for when you really need her. Um, and so I, I worry that because the schedule is so front loaded, which it does have to be, you know, UConn, mm -hmm. because the Big East is what the Big East is, UConn has to front load the non-conference schedule. Um, but I, I think that can make it difficult to, you know, once they hit the second half of the season, it's it'll be interesting to see where where they're at just sort of, physically in terms of being able to to carry it through that that home stretch for sure um i have to ask uh what about carolyn ducharm i know she's been dealing with some head and neck injuries I, you know these are talk about delicate um how is, is the staff so un, unsure about whether she'll be back on the court at all this season yeah i think she is all season pretty much going to be a very day-to-day -day type of type of thing you know it's she's been in practice she's you know taking shots and involved in things I'm not sure at this point if she's like doing any contact or anything like that um and she's one who like won't be available for, for sure. the opener yeah, and things yeah. like that but it, it wouldn't shock me if we see her at some point you know just based on kind of the, the trajectory and the way things seem but it also wouldn't shock me if we don't like I think so much of her recovery is just trial and error and seeing how she's feeling and seeing what bothers her and what doesn't. So you just kind of have to, to play the guessing game and play it day by day. And when she's feeling good, hopefully she plays. And if she's not, then she won't, you know, and, and I will say they've been very good about being careful with her, you know, like she didn't push it last year at, you know, she played those, those couple of games. And as soon as she started having issues, you know, they pulled her, they, they've been very cautious with her. So you know, I, we're not going to see her out there unless it's safe for her. I, I don't think. Gino made a quote. This is him. Him. And this is not me. So I'm hoping that we start to find our identity sometime in November, end of November. Do you do you find that as kind of like a, a decent time frame? You know, by the pretty much that's a, a fewer kind of by games or you know smaller games, and then you play North Carolina and Greensboro. Um, maybe by by the Notre Dame game, if you will. 
Is, is that fair? Is that fair? Is that a fair assessment on his part? Or you think that's even still a little, little, little quick? Yeah, I mean, it might be, it might be optimistic for sure. Huh? Um, I, I think, but but I do think that is like, if you want to beat Louisville, Notre Dame, Iowa State, USC, practically back to back to back to back. <laughs> you have to have it by then, you know, I, I think, and they might not, it will not surprise me if they don't have it by then and they drop a couple of those games. Um, and frankly, even if they have it by then, they might drop a couple of those games. Sure. Um, but, you know, it's, I think it's so hard when you might still have people coming back at the end of November, you know, you might be adding Ayanna Patterson in for the first time sure. in a couple of weeks. And then, you know, after that, then you're adding AZ back in and, and then potentially you're adding Caroline back in and, you know, you still have, you know, Jenna Alfi who has never played a college game, who is literally, you know, will be four weeks into her college basketball career, essentially by the time, right. you know, you hit that stretch of games. So it's definitely possible. Like I, I think, the benefit that a lot of these players have is that they know each other very well. Like, you know, someone like Jana or someone even like Ice Brady have been around for a couple of years, even though they haven't been playing for all of that time. Um, and so a lot of these guys are just sort of on a, on a personal level, very close and very connected and sort of know each other very well. And that, I think at the college level, especially really, really makes a big difference, especially in those early on days when you're just kind of running on whatever you can get. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, it, I think ideally by the time, you know, you, you get done with um, the, the Bahama tournament in the Bahamas um, and once you get through Holy Cross and head into Louisville, like that's where you want to feel like you have an identity. Because, um, yeah, I think if you go into those four games not confident, it, it's not that stretch is not going to end well for them. Gotcha. Hey, are you are you, get, you getting to go to the Bahamas or, or are we are we I not? Am. I just Ooh. had my travel approved for the non conference slate, so yeah, I'll be at everything before Christmas, um, and then after that, we'll see for for Biggie's play. Man, does uh, does your counterpart Joe get to go to go to Hawaii? I believe he is. Yes, I haven't talked to him since they since they made everything official with the budgets, but I think Joe is headed to Maui as well. Wow, I was just about to say it's 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 like a it's like a, a a really fun thing for the players this year to be. One's going to Hawaii, one's going to the Bahamas. That's wild. That's and also for you guys, I'm very happy for you. That's so cool. Um, but back to back to uh, the questions. When we return, we'll talk guard rotation and we'll talk a little bit about where we think it's going to play with KK, Caitlin, and Ashlyn and the rookies coming up after this. All right, Husky fans, we're talking five-hour energy. Let's get energized. And you know what it's like to be a true Husky fan. It's not just a hobby. It's a way of life. Whether we're cheering courtside or right every or every buzzer beater or celebrating each win, we need serious energy to keep us up. That's why they've created Stan the Fan five-hour energy shot with a special flavor called Fan Fuel. It's made for us, the fans, who never miss a game and always go the extra mile. Let me tell you. What gave me some extra fan fuel this week was Doral Robinson's 68-yard touchdown to seal the win over Rice in a relatively docile game. That was like a shot of fan fuel right there. Moments like that, that's what we live for. 5-Hour Energy knows that no matter who you root for, being a fan takes heart, soul, and a whole lot of energy. So stay in the fan energy shot. Stay fueled all season long. What's your fan fuel this week? Whatever it is, do it with 5-Hour Energy. All right, you're back with Emily Adams and Mark Zanetto. Emily from the Hartford Current. We just uh, found out that she's going to the Bahamas. Uh, I am not invited. Uh, I would love to, but um, again, I'm not invited. Uh, I that's so cool. But I, I'm, I'm I'm happy for you. But I, I really was interested in the conversation that Gina was talking about about these early struggles, and I think that's all going to really tie into whether whether they have early struggles is going to be about the guard rotation and how how they kind of get that all squared away. I mean, you do have ball, you do have ball handlers outside of page, right? So it's kind of a, you know, do some of these, do some of these gals, like, do they just kind of like give up that or is, or are they, are they trying to work in a rotation around KK, Caitlin and Ashlyn? How's that all going to work in your estimation and what you've heard? Yeah, I think in some ways it's going to be sort of similar to, to the way it was with the dynamic between page and Nika the last couple of years where, you know, 
Nika really was the primary ball handler, was kind of the primarily running the point. And I think that's going to be the role um, that Caitlin kind of steps into. Um, obviously, the big difference with Caitlin that, that Gino's talked about a lot is that she is a much, much better scorer than Nika was. Um, so I think hopefully we'll see a little bit more balance of, of Paige being able to be on ball a little bit more um, than she has been the last two years. Uh, but yeah, I think, you know, those two plus KK are kind of going to end up being that that ball handler point guard rotation, again, in kind of the same way that they flowed last year, you know, between the three of them with with Mika and Paige. Um, but yeah, I think, and then you'll see, you know, Ashlyn Shade's obviously more of kind of a true two. Um, mm-hmm. So we'll, we'll see more of her in that in that role. And I think Ali Zebel um, fits there as well. Um, and there's been a lot, I mean, Gino, Gino spoken really, really highly of her, um, out, out of that freshman group, obviously, you know, we sort of expected it with Sarah. Um, mm-hmm. but you know, Allie's someone who, you know, every time he's asked like, who has surprised you, Allie is the first name that comes up. I think, you know, he's talked about her being just sort of a lot more versatile than kind of the, the shooter reputation that she has. Um, so I, I'm really excited to see, I think, you know, once they're playing in actual game situations how she kind of fits in how quickly she can adapt to just like the pace and physicality and everything of the college game um but she's a little bit bigger guard at at six foot so I think she's someone too who I'm expecting to see get into the rotation fairly early and often yeah she was impressive on first night um as far as uh her range I think she made 11 of her first 12 threes um in that three-point shootout I mean I know it's just kind of like them horsing around but still she's she is that reputation, you know, was was warranted. But I always find that when it's when you're a shooter, that you try to do other things to make sure that your coach knows that you are versatile. And in <laughs> in her in her high school profile is is that anyway. I mean, she averaged I think eight rebounds a game, five assists. So hopefully, um, she does kind of adapt to that physicality and, and can be a, a, a like a positional versatility type player for them, not just not just a score. Um, okay. Um, I get most of my questions from fans are like, you know, you don't you don't talk about Ashlyn Shade enough. You don't talk about KK Arnold enough. So mm-hmm. let's take those two because they've they obviously played huge roles last year for for UConn and were forced into this in, into extra duty, so to speak. Probably didn't think they were going to play as many minutes as they were, um, and they they and they excelled. What can can we expect them to take a, a next step? Coaches are always talking about, you know, it's not just about who you bring in; it's the players that you keep on that kind of make those those leaps to being better players. Do you think they've added anything to their game that you can speak of that could potentially elevate them to to be even better this year? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think with with KK, you know, we saw KK was in the gym a lot this summer, um, kind of with with different trainers. She was sort of doing a similar thing, it seems like, to what Paige was doing, you know, had a lot of, of individual trainers working with her on kind of adding stuff to the bag. It seemed like she she obviously went out to Kelsey Plum's dog camp um to during uh was that like right around the WNBA draft um and and talked after that about kind of working with her on on adding some more offensive dimension to her game um so I I think that's that's kind of her next step is is as a scorer um and getting more efficient and and getting more successful at getting downhill um and with Ashlyn I, I think you know her next step is really I think just to kind of get more confident and more consistent in the things that she did last year. You know, like Ashlyn, Ashlyn at her best looked very, very college ready last year. Like she's very polished. She's very technical. She like does all the little things right. Um, But I think she is someone who a lot of it's mental for her. Like she gets in her head, she gets nervous. um, And, you know, if the shots aren't falling early, she has trouble getting back into it. Um, and so I think for her, just coming in with another year of confidence, another year of experience, another year of kind of just like knowing how the offense works and and knowing how the system runs and being comfortable with the team, I think is going to really do do wonders for her just kind of as as a consistent contributor and, and as kind of someone who they can can rely on to do to do the dirty work. For sure. Well, listen, Emily, thank you so much for taking some time away. Um, when you don't come on during the week, we do get uh, – there's no phone here, but we, don't, we do get emails and messages about where's Emily? When is she going to be back? So uh, hopefully we can find a time to continue doing this weekly, uh, and we'll, we'll kind of talk about that offline. But really appreciate you. This has been another episode of Locked on UConn for Emily Adams, beat reporter for the Hartford Current. I'm Mark Snedo asking you to, to stay locked on, stay connected, and to remember it's not just about – 
getting it done. It's about doing it in a way that it can be done, can't be done any better. That's our goal every day. So thank you, Gino, for letting me co-opt that quote. As always, go Huskies.